so we thought it might be fun, I think, right, Daniel, to talk about the resurrection because it's such a central um, part of our uh, belief system as Christians. And it's one of the most spectacular claims that Christianity makes. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, virgin birth, uh, miracles. Uh, I mean, you know, th- those are those are pretty big claims, but the resurrection is a whopper. <laughs> yeah. And and everything else kind of hinges on that. Um, yeah. C.S. Lewis talked about in the book Miracles that um, he was comparing it like with Buddhism. Some traditions ascribe miraculous acts to to the Buddha. And I think some traditions ascribe miraculous acts to Muhammad, but like the, the religion itself is not in any way tied to reported miracles. Like, you know, the religion doesn't stand or fall with the true claims of, of those particular miraculous reports. And he said that um, Christianity is really the only religion that like its entire validity is completely inextricably bound up with this miraculous claim. And if it didn't happen, then the whole religion is just completely unraveled. Um, that's unlike other religions, you know? Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, also, I, it's hard to wrap, like if I'm, if I'm coming from a skeptical perspective, it's, it's, um, it's hard to just pick up some ancient book about something that seems very legendary uh, and very much like other um, ancient myths where gods come to earth and uh, take human form, um, perhaps even die and resurrect. What, why, why should we give any validity to, to the Christian claim of resurrection as opposed to the resurrection of the corn king in pagan mythology? Yeah, that's a I mean, that's a the point that gets brought up a fair bit, and I think for some for, for some Christians it can be kind of unsettling to find out that there are these earlier pre-Christian stories that sound so similar. Um, I have to quote C.S. Lewis a lot just because he's like the, the go-to person, but he he pointed out that and she and G.K. Chesterton had kind of pointed this out as well, like if um. If, if the Christian story is, is true and if the resurrection is really the central event in human history, which is what Christians would say, then it shouldn't be surprising if there are precursors or foreshadowings of that throughout history. And so, um, so I guess I would say for starters, Christians don't need to be like alarmed by the fact that there are other stories. Like that's, that's you know, it's, it's certainly plausible to say that God, it was preparing the human race for the, the true story through those earlier myths. But what distinguishes the Christian story from those myths is that um, like the corn King or what you mentioned, like um, none of those myths ever uh, claimed any kind of historical um, authenticity. Like, you know, they didn't, um, you, you don't see them you know, written in ancient history books and um C.S. Lewis described the Christian story as the myth that actually happened, you know, because Pontius Pilate is a, is a Roman governor that his existence is not just in the Bible. You can look him up in secular history and, and verify that he was the governor of that region. Um, all the, the basic facts, Jesus's resurrection, you know, his execution by Rome. Um, these are things that are not shadowy, mythical you know, it happened somewhere, sometime, you know, it, like it's, it's pinpointed, like it happened during this person's uh, office and it happened under this person's authority, you know, so there are historical, you know, connections there that distinguish it from just, you know, a typical like ancient myth, you know. <clears throat> and didn't you say uh, G.K. Chesterton had a great quote about it when someone brought up in a debate or maybe it was a newspaper back and forth between him and someone else that, uh, you know, well, what about all these other religions that, or myths that say the same thing? That that must be proof that it's not true. And what did he say? Uh, well, he was, again, kind of using the argument that these were, these older stories were God's way of kind of pointing to the, the real thing. And he said, um, 
the, the existence of this this idea of a, of a god coming down to earth and dying back to life like the fact that it's in every culture and every every age and humanity has been crying out and pointing to it from time immemorial proves that it's not there and uh that's you know that's chesterton's witty way of, of kind of turning it on its head you know he was just essentially repeating the uh the argument that the the skeptic was making yeah uh, but putting it in different words yeah yeah right <laughs> he's amazing just the way that he can uh turn something like that on its head it, it's like you think you've got him in checkmate and then all of a sudden yeah. you find yourself in checkmate and laughing at the same time well, so. <laughs> well, Justin, it's funny because he, he mr blatchford the the skeptic that he was discussing this with he was going through mr blatchford's reasons for objecting to christianity and chesterton said like if he had to list his reasons for being a Christian, they would essentially be Blatchford's reasons for not being a Christian. Like <laughs> they were essentially the same reasons. And um, so it's a, yeah, he's, he pointed out like some people uh, criticize the, the crudity of the Bible, like saying God appeared in a burning bush and like sometimes picturing God in, in real earthy terms. And, and uh, Chesterton said that, you know, if, if they had described these things in like really metaphysical, flowery, philosophical language, that would be a reason not to believe it. And so the fact that it sounds so earthy and crude means they were just reporting what they saw. He said, if a child, uh, you know, claims that, you know, God is this invisible energy that pervades all reality, he said he would just assume he'd been with his, his you know, some adult teacher. But if he said God was in the garden, he might say, well, maybe the child saw something, you know, like the more like, non-sophisticated it sounds you know it's actually an argument for its authenticity you know yeah it's really cool um all right so i've heard multiple reasons and we can go through them in detail in later videos but that um point to the credibility of the the accounts of the resurrection um both uh, historical uh, evidences and um, literary uh, sort of evidences. And then um, John Lennox likes to say, uh, you know, the, the, you, uh, the testability of the claim of the resurrection and the claim of the work of Jesus in our lives. Um, and, you know, he often says, people object to Christianity because it's not testable and we, we should only believe things that are testable and proven to be true. And first of all, that's a, a faulty reasoning because you can't, uh, that statement itself isn't testable, you know? Um, uh, and, that would, and that would make the, the past essentially unknowable, no matter what ancient event you're talking about. I mean, right. The past is never testable in that kind of sense. <clears throat> right. And he goes on to say that, that, even so, it is testable in our own lives. It, very much like C.S. Lewis pointed to the um, hit, arguing from his own internal experience, which he, you know, they recognize there's limits to the, that um, way of explaining it, you know, because anyone based on subjective experience can claim anything, but, but the, uh, just the overwhelming amount of people who say, I trusted this person, this being, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm transformed by the power of his love. You know, there's something that happened to me and I can't explain it. And um, anyway, so I think there's lots of anecdotes like that. And one of my favorite quotes, I need to look it up and put it in the description, but it's, um, uh, it might be Wittgenstein who said, uh, yeah, Ludwig, Wittgenstein, he said, I, in, in the context, I think, of all the uh, objections to believing the resurrection and the reasons to believe in the resurrection, he said, in the end, it's love that believes in the resurrection. Uh, you know, you can sort of reason your way there, but to, what gets you all the way there is love. Yeah. Anyway, and I, I mean, I think that that just kind of speaking in the, the sense of the Holy Spirit's work within us, you know, the 
pours out his love into our hearts, you know, through the Holy Spirit, says Paul, and um, cries out, Abba, Father, within us, uh, and attests to the resurrection, you know, um, within us. Anyway, all of that's experiential. But so can you talk some more? I think you mentioned the historical, some of the historical reasons for thinking that this was more than just a myth, uh, like times and dates and people and places. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the, um, the criteria we impose on other things we believe historically uh, happened um, yeah. versus the, the um, like what evidence is required to believe that Plato existed and did and said what people said he did and said um, yeah. And how can we compare that to the uh, evidence we require for something like the resurrection? So in, in mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis talked about believing things on authority. And he said that phrase can be troubling to some people because it makes it, it sounds like, you know, believing something because somebody else said it without scrutinizing it. But he said, really believing things on authority is is what all scholars do when, when they're investigating the past because um, he said like you couldn't prove by abstract reasoning that you know Napoleon was the emperor of France like you, you can't like scientifically or mathematically like deduce these things you have to rely on written sources from the time period and um, the case for Christ by Lee Strobel is probably the best place to go for um, a breakdown of like very specific you know statistics about the number of manuscripts that attest to other ancient events compared to the scriptures uh, um a lot of the uh ancient writings that describe like the trojan war and uh, other like greek and roman events the earliest manuscripts we have were several hundred years after those events were said to have occurred and yet nobody would seriously question the accuracy of those accounts. Um, the New Testament, we have, you know, fragments of the New Testament, um, I think dating back to the late first century, you know, just a few genera a couple generations after the events were said to have occurred. So that's one of the reasons why C.S. Lewis, as a literary scholar, said whatever the Gospels are, they're not legends because there wasn't enough time to have elapsed uh, in order for a legend to occur. And he said also from a literary perspective, they're not they're not literary enough to be legends they're just kind of sloppy you know they're, they're not written in a really um eloquent you know poetic sort of way that that le legends and myths were, were written back then um they they had, were just much more matter of factly you know written um so um but yeah lee strobel's book the case for christ is the best place to go for for a real specific look at, at that criteria and uh, yeah, he, he mentions great stuff in that book. He was a journalist, an investigative journalist, or just yeah. a journalist? Chicago okay. Tribune, yeah. Okay, and he was coming from a place of extreme skepticism. Wasn't he, in fact, just trying to disprove it? Well, um, his wife had become a believer, and um, he, he, he wasn't a believer. He, yeah, he wanted to kind of, um, I think, shore up his own skepticism because he, he felt... Um, I don't say he felt pressured to, by his wife to, to reconsider his, his ideas, but he, he, I think he felt a little threatened by her new faith. So he wanted to look into it himself. And yeah, he, he wasn't looking like to convince himself it was true. Yeah, he was kind of hoping to solidify in his mind that it was okay not to believe it was true. Um, but he just kind of kept pressing into it with uh, a particular amount of journalistic integrity. Yeah. And uh, found himself seeing that if he was going to apply the same logic he used, he applied when trusting in other uh, things like witness testimony or um, uh, historical documents or any anything any other sort of secular thing that we um, say merits our trust. If we use those same criteria, then then the account of the resurrection, the witnesses that are listed, the, um, the way that it's written um, is uh, 
should be using those same criteria far more trustworthy than most of the things we take as fact, you know? Yeah. Um, I, a lot of people, um, I think have a misconception about when they're, when they're looking into this question, they, um, and Lee Strobel, I think is, and, and C.S. Lewis do a good job of kind of dispelling this. Like some people have the mistaken idea that Christians begin with a belief that the Bible is, um, this divine sacred book and then they therefore go on to believe whatever it says because of this prior belief that it's divine and sacred and has to be believed and so they the accusation is it's arguing in a circle you know the bible is god's word and we we believe it the resurrection because the bible says the resurrection happened and we believe the bible says is god's word because it says it's god's word and um i would just i would say for starters you don't have to begin with a prior like bias in favor of this being a divine sacred book in order to just look at the facts that it records and, and just look at them the way you look at any other ancient book i mean lee strobel certainly didn't believe it didn't begin you know with a prior belief that everything the bible said was true um he just approached it as if it was any other book you know and held it to the same standards of any other book and you know so it, it's okay to begin there you don't have to begin um, I, in fact, I don't think you really can if you expect a non-Christian to have this really high, grandiose view of the scripture if they don't believe the central story of Jesus' resurrection. I mean, that has to come first, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I think this would be fun to explore in greater detail. Um, um, but suffice it to say for now, um, uh, we and and billions of others on earth feel that the resurrection has um, historical uh, validity and experiential validity and uh, that we can sense in a real way that we are also um, becoming a part of that same resurrection as love uh, himself works his way through us and all of creation. I know that was kind of <laughs> getting on the spiritually side of things, but uh, at, I feel like lots of people from any walk of faith any religion throughout history have, have sensed that uh, the world isn't as it should be and that uh, it needs to be resurrected. And we believe because of the evidence we mentioned and the love that permeates the story and our hearts through the story that uh, Jesus was the first of that resurrection that will come to everything and all creation. Kind of, kind of on that theme, I, I guess it might be worth pointing out that, like, just for clarity, for if people are not clear on what exactly is meant by the term, when we talk about Christ being resurrected, we we don't we don't simply mean that he was like resuscitated, like the same way that other resurrections were said to have occurred, like Jesus raised raised people from the dead. In his earthly ministry according to the gospels but jesus's resurrection is described as, as unique and unlike any other because he didn't just come back to life like lazarus did and then later experience death the way all people will um the christian belief is that he rose from the dead immortal he rose again um a whole new mode of existence basically um a glorified you know, immortal body and um that's the really shocking thing the new testament spells out is like he, he's the first person to experience this new mode of life and all Christians are promised to experience that as well if they're united to him so it's it's not I mean the gospels when they record Jesus healing a person who's died and bringing them back to life that's impressive I mean certainly <laughs> but Jesus is, is Jesus's um story is is not just that it's it's far more significant than that yeah N.T. Wright says that he's the first one to come out the other side of death yeah 
not just die and then kind of, like you say, be resuscitated, but but die and come out the other side. Um, yeah. And that that's just super cool. I, and they had words in Greek for these other things, like some sort of spiritual rebirth or yeah. you know, in, in some non-corporeal form or resuscitation like you're saying or any of these other things they could have described it with a different greek word but the greek word they chose was a bodily resurrection um and uh there so either they're talking about a really resurrected jesus or they're just mistaken there's there's no other uh possibility as to what they're talking about yeah, to argue that it was a spiritual resurrection of some sort, and some people have argued that, I think is, is really hard to maintain because, I mean, the biggest uh, drawback to, to any kind of argument about that is that if there was a body that could be produced, um, Jesus' enemies would, would certainly have produced it as the disciples began to spread this new message. And one thing you see in the book of Acts, I mean, no, nobody ever contested the fact the tomb was empty. That was never a point of contention. Um, you know, what happened to Jesus' body might have been a point of contention, but the fact that the tomb was empty was never a point of contention. And um, yeah, a spiritual resurrection wouldn't, you know, wouldn't really account for that at all. Yeah. But um, as LeVar Burton would say, don't take our word for it. Go check it out. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, apply apply all due skepticism it's a big claim it really is but but feel it out and and uh see see what you think um and uh apply the same skepticism to your skepticism you know um another book that is worth mentioning i think is a book called more than a carpenter by josh mcdowell he wrote that back in the 70s and his yeah. story was kind of similar to lee strobel's he started out um, as a skeptic and as he as he examined everything he had a change of heart and a change of mind and he does a good job in his book pointing out that um if you if you disbelieve in the the christian account of why jesus's tomb was empty it's, it, you kind of need to have some alternative account that you can that can make sense of of all the facts and um you know the the most common theory among the, the people of Israel was the disciples had stolen the body. And um, he, he addresses that because the disciples were all executed for, for their preaching. And um, he says, you know, that doesn't prove they didn't steal the body. You, know, you, could, you could argue that they stole the body and they, they preached this lie that he'd risen from the dead. But he said, the problem with that is you have, you, in that case, you'd have them dying for a lie while knowing that it was a lie he said you can find people all throughout history who've died for lies but it was usually people who were genuinely deceived but he said it's very hard to to find a way to account for, if the disciples uh if disciples uh, you know were preaching that jesus had risen from the dead it's hard to see how they themselves were deceived like if they stole the body they would have known where the body was and it anyway he he says there's just no way they could have been genuinely ignorant of what they were saying. Like they, they either were preaching the truth or they were knowingly preaching a lie. There's not really a middle option, um, which I think is a pretty compelling argument, you know, given the fact that again, they all did die you know, for, for their preaching. Right. Um, well, cool, man. Let's, uh, let's plan to take this point by point and delve a little deeper into these subjects we touched on generally. And the next few videos, is that all right? Yeah, um, sounds good. And um, Easter's coming up. <laughs> so it's a good time to be talking about yeah. those things. All right, my friend.